Welcome to the second installment in our Bible study series on Galatians. So today we're going to be exploring some deep theological themes and connecting some dots as we work our way through Paul's public confrontation with Peter in the second half of chapter 2. And we're going to look at what's going on there. And as I mentioned in part one, this ministry is all about defending the biblical roots of Christianity from false teachings like Torahism, which you might know as Hebrew roots. And this is an apologetics Bible study. So we're approaching the book of Galatians with an eye for the, the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. And, and there's a whole lot of that here in this book. So, to get us up to speed, let's do a quick recap. In part one, we talked about how this book is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches that, that he had planted in Galatia. And he's writing because these churches were being influenced by false teachers, by Judaizers who were teaching that Gentile Christians were required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be, to be saved or accepted into God's family. They were essentially teaching that you had to convert to Judaism before you could follow Jesus. And we talked about how this letter was written at a very confusing time. Yeshua's arrival was a sort of theological bomb exploding on the timeline of history. And Paul's letter to the Galatians was written in the aftermath of that explosion, when there was still dust in the air and debris everywhere, theologically speaking. So the young church, especially the Jewish believers, were trying to figure out what the death and resurrection of Yeshua meant. These were the, the first days of the new covenant. So the churches in Galatia had fallen under a spell, so to speak, of these false teachers, these Judaizers. And Paul wrote this passionate letter to them to set the record straight. So in part one, we were introduced to these false teachings, which Paul describes in, in chapter 1, verse 7 as a distortion of the gospel of Christ. And he goes on to share some information about his own conversion and, and how he learned the gospel directly from Jesus. And then Paul spends some time telling his story and defending his apostolic credentials from, from the apparent attempts of the false teachers who were trying to undermine him. And so Paul went up to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles and the leaders of the growing Christian church. And he brought Titus, a, a Greek believer, with him. It was a sort of test to see if the apostles in Jerusalem would require Titus to be circumcised before accepting him into the fold, but they didn't. All the apostles agreed that Gentiles don't need to be circumcised or keep the law of Moses in order to join God's family. And then the apostles extended the right hand of fellowship to Paul, and that's where part one ended, and we're going to pick up today. And by the way, if you like videos like this, would you help support our channel by subscribing and sharing this video with your friends? Thank you. Okay, so part one ended at chapter two, verse 10, with Paul in Jerusalem with the apostles. And we're gonna pick up in the very next verse, and, and you'll notice that the setting is changed to Antioch, verse 11. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypo hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So this passage is absolutely bursting with theological implication. So let's camp out here for a minute because this is a significant event in the early church and it has a lot to say about the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. As I said, the, the, the events that we're reading about in this passage happened in the very early days of the New Covenant when both Jews and Gentiles were, were still trying to figure out what the death and resurrection of Jesus meant. And so the inspired writings of the New Testament authors, including this letter to the, to the churches in Galatia, were God's direction for the newly forming body of Christ under his brand new covenant. So there's an unknown period of time that elapsed between verse 10 and verse 11 in this chapter. 
Verse 10 ends with, with Paul and the apostles in Jerusalem. And, and verse 11 starts, as we just read, but when Peter came to Antioch. So Paul's confrontation with Peter is a separate event that happened in a different place. And these verses tell us that in the time between the handshake in Jerusalem and this confrontation in Antioch, Peter went from eating with the Gentiles to separating himself from them. Verse 12, For before certain men came from James, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So what's going on with Peter here? Well, Paul describes a time when Peter was enjoying fellowship with all the believers, Jews and Gentiles alike, as one family in Christ. And in first century Hebrew culture, to eat with someone meant to accept them as equals. It's one of the reasons we see the Pharisees getting mad at Jesus for eating with sinners and tax collectors. So when Peter was eating with the Gentiles, he was acknowledging that Jews and Gentiles were on the same level in God's eyes. But under pressure from the Judaizers, he began wavering on that issue. And throughout scripture, Peter, who was raised as an Orthodox Jew, seems to kind of struggle to understand this message. In fact, I think it'd be helpful to understanding what's going on here between Peter and Paul if we take a brief sidebar here and look at Peter's track record in Scripture with the kosher food laws. There's actually a pattern in Scripture of Peter struggling to understand this issue in light of Jesus. For example, in Matthew 15, verse 11, we read about Jesus telling the Pharisees, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, meaning out of the heart, our inner thoughts. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? They were likely offended because in Leviticus 11, it says that eating unclean food does defile a person. This is the chapter in the Torah where all the prohibited foods are listed. And in verse 43, we read, You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. So the Torah says, Don't eat these detestable things because it defiles you. And yet in Matthew 15, Jesus teaches that it's not what goes into the mouth that truly defiles a person. And this was offensive to the, to the Pharisees and apparently confusing to the disciples as well. So which of his disciples do you think was the first one to speak up and ask Jesus to clarify what he meant? <laughs> it was Peter, of course. Verse 15, but Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. They couldn't wrap their minds around what Jesus was teaching. I mean, from our perspective in modern Christianity, it seems pretty obvious. Yeah, it's not the food we eat, it's the wicked things that we hold in our hearts that defile us, like lust and greed and hatred, right? But in the context of first century Judaism, this idea was so mind-blowing that, that it seemed wrong. The, the Mosaic food laws were so baked into, <laughs> pun intended, baked into the rhythm of Hebrew life that Yeshua's disciples were having trouble working out what he was saying. So Jesus explained what he was talking about. And his explanation begins with what, what feels like an exasperated comment, verse 16. And he said, are you also still without understanding? <laughs> it's almost like he's saying, look, I get that the Pharisees are thick-headed about this, but you're my disciples. I've been trying to teach you. Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person? You almost get the sense that Peter was thinking, um, okay, the, the lesson wasn't landing, because later, after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and, and ascended to heaven, God gives Peter a vision of a sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals on it. We read about this in Acts 10, uh, verse 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, 
for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So think about what this says about Peter. He's the kind of man who's so committed to Jewish tradition, so devoted to the law of Moses, that he would openly oppose a command from God himself. (laughs) The, The Lord commanded Peter to eat, and he responded, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And so the Lord rebukes Peter, saying in verse 15, What God has made clean, do not call common. And by the way, this happened three times in a row, so Peter's a little hard-headed. And then God sends him to the house of a Gentile named Cornelius, where Peter says, verse 28, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And by the way, the Greek word here for unlawful is a themitone. And it doesn't refer to the Mosaic law. It just means wrong or forbidden. So it could even be related to traditions or or rabbinic regulations at the time. And it's no coincidence that unclean food and unclean people are linked in the narrative here in Acts 10. Because those two things, unclean food and unclean people, are linked in the Torah as well. We just saw that in Leviticus 11. And we see it again in Leviticus 20. God tells Israel, verse 25, You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. And there's that idea again that the food that goes in your mouth defiles you and makes you unclean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by eating these things. And in the next verse, God explains to Israel why he's given them these food laws. Because if you think about it, the list of forbidden animals is pretty arbitrary. And and scripture never tells us why some animals were judged clean and others weren't. How did Yahweh arrive at the criteria that land animals who are cloven-footed and and chew the cud are are to be considered clean? or that water animals with fins and scales are clean. I mean, you'll hear some theories and and speculation, especially from our Hebrew roots friends, who like to suggest that it has something to do with food safety or bacteria. But the Bible actually never tells us how God arrived at, at that particular list of animals. But the next verse here in Leviticus 20 tells us the reason for the food prohibitions in general. Verse 26, you shall be holy to me, For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So the idea is that Israel was to be holy. V'item li kadoshim. You are to be holy to me. Which means set apart for God, distinct from everyone else. It says God has separated Israel from the peoples, from the other nations. He separated the Jews from the Gentiles. And one way he did that was with an arbitrary list of prohibited foods, which actually makes a lot more sense than if the foods on the list were prohibited for for reasons that were obvious. For example, if the animals in Leviticus 11 were prohibited because they carried parasites and and caused sickness, well, then the Gentiles would have good reason to, to avoid eating those animals as well, and Israel would cease to be distinct. This would simply become a list of animals that everyone avoided eating because they caused health problems. What makes Israel special and set apart and holy is that this is a list given by Yahweh and it's to be obeyed for no other reason than it was given by Yahweh. So under the law of Moses, God used food as a means to set Israel apart from the Gentile nations. And in Acts 10, under the New Covenant, God uses food as a means to show that Jews are no longer to be set apart from Gentiles. And Peter went to Cornelius, a Gentile, and the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his his whole household, and they were all saved. So under the New Covenant, the dividing wall of hostility, as as the Apostle Paul calls it in Ephesians 2, the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles was torn down by Jesus. And this is why, as we read in Mark 7, 19, Jesus declared all foods clean. 
because Gentiles were now grafted into God's family, there was no longer a need for the kosher food laws that kept them separate. So with that background, let's head back to Galatians 2, and we can see the progression with Peter. Paul says in verse 12, For before certain men came from James, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. So after the vision in Acts 10 and Peter's bringing the gospel to the Gentiles through Cornelius, he had been eating with the Gentiles. He had accepted them as equal in God's eyes. But then something changed. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So isn't that interesting? Peter was afraid of the circumcision party, the Judaizers. I mean, he wasn't afraid to obey the Lord when he sent him to Cornelius. And following that, he wasn't afraid to, to eat with Gentiles, but he was afraid of the Judaizers. And that fear caused him to waver. This is so reminiscent of the episode where Peter walked on water. In Matthew 14, we read, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And you get the sense that the same thing's happening here in Antioch. Peter of little faith began to doubt whether he should eat with Gentiles or not, right? He, he was wavering. And Paul was calling him to the carpet on it because Peter was arguably the most well-known apostle at the time. And his, his equivocation on this issue caused others to go astray as well. Verse 13, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So, so Peter caused this sort of avalanche of hypocrisy among the early Jewish believers. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, there's a few things to notice here. First of all, Paul is reiterating that this is a gospel matter, right? He says, their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. And we looked at this in part one of this Bible study in Paul's opening remarks in, in chapter one, verses six through nine, he calls the false teaching of the Judaizers a different gospel. And he describes it as a distortion of the gospel of Christ. So for Paul, the truth of the gospel is at stake here, which explains why he publicly confronted Peter about this issue. Peter was publicly leading Jewish believers astray, and so Paul administered public correction. Now, the text doesn't tell us, but you wonder if, if during Paul's rebuke, he reminded Peter of the events of Acts 10 with the, with the, the vision of the sheet coming down from heaven and, and the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius the Gentile, right? Because at that time, Peter had said in Acts 10:28. God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And now Paul is challenging him on that very point. And this speaks directly to Paul's apostolic credentials and authority. Here was Paul, the newest apostle, publicly rebuking Peter, the oldest and perhaps most well-known apostle. I mean, Peter and his, his brother Andrew were the first two men that Jesus called to follow him. And, and Paul has worked up here. Now, Peter may not have fully realized it, but his withdrawing from, from fellowship with the Gentiles was telegraphing to the church that Gentiles weren't as good or worthy as Jewish believers, that they were lacking the fullness of the gospel in some sense. I mean, otherwise, why separate from them? Andrew Knowles says this, If Peter's hypocrisy had infected the whole church, the result would have been a split between Jewish and Gentile Christians. It may even have caused the true gospel to be lost, sunk without a trace beneath the waves of Jewish legalism. And in his rebuke, Paul makes a statement that's a little tricky to follow. He says to Peter in verse 14, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? <laughs> so, Exactly what Paul means here is a little bit difficult to work out, and, and there are various opinions. Now, to me, Paul seems to be saying that, that Peter, an Orthodox Jew, 
lived like a Gentile for a time, right? Sharing meals with them and, and eating whatever they ate. And by doing so, he had erased the distinction between Jew and Gentile. And Paul's asking him how he can then turn around and force the Gentiles to live like Jews, which suggests that, that Peter was pressuring the Gentile believers to observe the kosher food laws in order to be accepted into fellowship, which is exactly what the false teachers wanted, right? Now, if Peter responded to Paul's reprimand, it's not recorded here. As Paul says in verse 11, Peter stood condemned. Peter was acting contrary to his own convictions, and he was, he was betraying the truth of the vision that God had given him in Acts 10, that the Gentiles are now accepted into God's family. And by doing so, Peter was shaming fellow believers, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He was bending the knee to the Judaizers. So Paul continues in verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So Paul's kind of saying, hey, one Jew to another, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And remember that the word Christ essentially means Messiah. So through faith in Jesus the Messiah. So we also have believed in Messiah Jesus in order to be justified by faith in the Messiah and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And Paul's saying here, hey, even we Jews to whom the law was given, it was given through our forefather Moses when Yahweh made a covenant with our nation. We who were brought up to keep that law, even we know that no one is counted righteous in God's eyes through works of the law. And, and, and look at how he repeats himself three times in this verse. Check it out. A person is not justified by works of the law not by works of the law. By works of the law, no one will be justified. He's really emphasizing this point. And on top of that, he repeats three times in the same sentence about faith in Yeshua, through faith in Jesus Christ. We also have believed in Christ Jesus. Be justified by faith in Christ. I mean, this is a densely packed verse, and Paul does not want his, his readers to miss the point. You get the sense that if Greek used exclamation points, Paul would have used a whole bunch of them in, in this one verse. And the point he's emphasizing is that the keeping of the law of Moses justifies no one. So Paul dealt with circumcision in Jerusalem. We saw that in part one, and here in Antioch, because he was admonishing Peter about eating with Gentiles, he seems to have the kosher food laws in view, right? And, and both circumcision and the kosher food laws were part of the law of Moses. And Paul, who was born and raised a Jew, is teaching that those things are no longer required under the new covenant. And this is a theologically significant passage because it's the first appearance of the word justification in this letter. The Greek word is dikaio. Is dikaio. And it might even be, if you believe like I do, that Galatians is Paul's earliest epistle, then this is the earliest appearance of the word justification in all of Paul's writing. So what's he talking about here? Justification is an idea borrowed from the legal world. Theologians call it a forensic term because it relates to courts of law. So dikaio is an act of God where he declares us righteous based on our faith in Yeshua. Justification isn't a process, it's an act. It's a declaration, really. God declares, like a judge in court, right? Like when we come to faith in Jesus, it's like we're standing in a courtroom before the living, holy God to face the charges for our, our copious sins, right? Both big and small. And God looks at us and he makes a legal declaration. I hereby declare, based on his faith in my son, Robert L. Solberg righteous in the eyes of this court. And then he bangs his gavel and, it, and that's it, it's done. We've been justified. So after that verdict is handed down, trying to keep the law as a, as a means of righteousness, which is what the Judaizers were preaching, and it's what Torahism or, or Hebrew roots teaches today, it's not just pointless, it actually impugns the sufficiency of Christ. It says, hey, what Jesus did for us was really nice, but it just wasn't enough. We need to keep these traditions and rituals so that we can continue to be righteous in God's eyes. 
Romans 5.1 says, since we have been, past tense, it's a done deal, justified by faith, we have, present tense, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification is an instant declaration by God over the sinner who has confessed faith in Jesus. And so here in Galatians, Paul's saying, no, even we Jewish believers know that no one is justified, no one, no one is made righteous through the works of the law. The repeated rituals and feasts and, and kosher diet and circumcision and so on, right? Paul repeats this three times in this one sentence. There's not a thing we can do to add to the righteousness that is ours when we put our faith in Jesus. And God makes his holy declaration and drops the gavel. So how dare Peter try to drive a wedge between believing Jews and Gentiles based on works of the law? And then Paul goes on, verse 17. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now, from a first century Jewish perspective, being without the law meant being a sinner. In fact, it, it was commonplace back then for the word Gentile to be followed by the word sinner. That's why Paul says in, in verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So the Judaizers seem to be arguing that, hey, if you don't have the law, you're a sinner. And therefore, if justification by faith eliminates the law, then it's encouraging sinful living. This is the same thing we hear from, from Torahism today. I can't tell you how many times I've been confronted by a Hebrew roots believer, who are all Gentiles, by the way, alleging that, hey, if the law of Moses is no longer in effect, then it's okay for Christians to murder and commit adultery? <laughs> this is what the Judaizers thought too, that, that if a person only needed to believe in Jesus to be saved, then they could just do whatever they want with, with no obligation or, or, or desire to do good works. Paul flatly rejects this idea by making the point that if Yeshua did away with the law so we could all freely sin, that would make Jesus a promoter of sin, which he is most certainly not. As we make our way further through the book of Galatians, Paul's going to speak at length about the right and proper use of the freedom that is ours in Christ. He didn't free us from the law so we could just gratify our flesh and do whatever we felt like doing. He freed us so that we could live lives that truly honor God. And here in chapter 2, Paul goes on to say that if a believer trusts Jesus alone for salvation, as Peter had done, and then spreads the gospel so that others would be saved through faith in Jesus, as Peter had done, and then he returns to the law, as Peter was doing, it undermines the truth of the gospel. And in that case, the law, Paul says, would only prove that he was a sinner, a transgressor. And Paul uses the first person here. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. But he's obviously talking about Peter, who was withdrawing from Gentile fellowship and returning to the law, or as Paul put it, rebuilding what he tore down. Continuing on, verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Whew. There is so much theological goodness here. And we have to admit that some of this language is exegetically ambiguous, right? Therefore, it's, it's difficult to, to fully understand it. I mean, for example, what does Paul mean? Through the law, I died to the law so that, so that I might live to God. Well, I think there are a couple ways we could understand this. And it's important we don't try to interpret the meaning of this verse on its own because it exists as part of this larger statement that Paul's making. So verse 19 starts with the, the Greek conjunction gar, which means because or for. So this verse is connected to the idea that precedes it. And the idea in verse 18, as we just saw, is that if we trust in Jesus for our salvation and then try to return to the law for our righteousness, we're undermining the truth of the gospel. And in verse 19, Paul then explains, hey, I say that because 
Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And he continues this comparison between dying and living in the next verse. I have been crucified with Christ, right? I died with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, obviously Paul's not talking about a literal physical death, right? Or that he was literally crucified with Jesus. So in what sense does he mean that he died to the law and he was crucified with Christ? And this is one of those areas where we could go down a theological rabbit hole so deep, we, we could spend years exploring it. And this Bible study obviously isn't the place for that, but let's at least shine a flashlight down the rabbit hole and see what's there. So in his later letters, we see how Paul develops this theme of dying to the law. For example, in Romans 7, Paul uses the illustration of how a married woman is released from the law of marriage if her husband dies. And he says in verse 4, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now, and catch this, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So there are some some clear parallels between what Paul says here in Romans 7 and what he's saying in Galatians 2. Now in Romans 7, 6, he says, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. So so he's clearly using the metaphor of death to refer to being released, right? And he teaches that the same way a married woman is released from the law of marriage if her husband dies, followers of Jesus are released from the law of Moses because of the death of Christ. And in Galatians 2, when Paul says, I died to the law so that I may live to God, it carries that same meaning, right? We are released from the law and we belong to Christ to bear fruit for God and we serve him in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. And this was all foretold actually in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus told him so himself. In Luke 24, after Jesus, Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand scripture. So Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses. It's the the same thing he says in Matthew 5 at the Sermon on the Mount. I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And I believe this is what Paul was getting at here in Galatians 2, verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law. In other words, it was because the law was fulfilled that Paul was released from it. And he goes on to say in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this identification with the death and resurrection of Christ is another theme that Paul elaborates on in later writings, including, again, in the book of Romans. Romans 6, 8 says, Now, if we have died with Christ we believe that we will also live with him. So in verses 19 and 20 here, Paul's driving home this idea that those who follow Jesus have, in a spiritual sense, died with him. And through that death, they've been released from the law. And we've also, in a spiritual sense, been resurrected with him, right? And as Paul says in verse 20, now we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So it's this whole movement away from the law of Moses and to Jesus. And in chapters 3 and 4, Paul is really going to elaborate on this idea. But before he does that, he closes out chapter 2 with this mic drop statement in verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. How anyone could read the book of Galatians and then teach that Christians are required to keep the law of Moses is, it's mind-boggling. For my Hebrew roots friends, hear me on this. 
If the reason you're keeping the kosher food laws or the Saturday Sabbath regulations or the annual feasts or circumcision, if you're keeping those things because you think this somehow makes you righteous in God's eyes, then you're spitting in Yeshua's face. You're saying that Christ died for no purpose. And I'm sorry, but don't give me this walking in obedience stuff because keeping the law of Moses is not how Christians show their obedience to Jesus. Not only have those laws never applied to Christians, but Paul explicitly tells us here in Galatians 2, and he's going to double and triple down on it in the coming chapters, that followers of Jesus have died with Jesus and through that death been released from the law. This is why I say that the theology of Torahism defies the, the sufficiency of Christ. If we were able to achieve our own righteousness by keeping the law, then why did Jesus give his life for us on the cross? Because to believe those Mosaic rituals are required is to believe that the sacrifice of Jesus wasn't enough, that it was insufficient to make us righteous. And that is the false gospel that Paul is railing against in this letter. Okay, this brings us to the end of chapter 2, and, and even though Paul's thought is going to spill over into chapter 3, this is probably a good spot to wrap up. So in our next episode, we'll dive deeper into chapter 3, where Paul's going to progress from this discussion about faith and works of the law into talking about what the arrival of Jesus means and, and tying it to the Old Testament and the nation of Israel and, and the Abrahamic promise and, and, and explaining the purpose of the law of Moses, why it was given. So much goodness. So thank you for watching. I hope you're finding these Bible studies helpful. I know I'm learning a ton as I'm digging deeper into scripture. So we'll pick it up again in part three. Shalom.